This brief unpleasantness, I call it brief, in so much as it is contained within few words, is quickly followed by the sweetness and the pleasure which I've already promised you, and which, unless you were told in advance, you would not perhaps be expecting to find after such a beginning as this. Believe me, if I could decently have taken you whither I desire by some other route, rather than along a path so difficult as this, I would gladly have done so. But since it is impossible without the, mer the mentor to show the origin of the event you will read about later, I really have no alternative but to address myself to its composition. You know what? I'm sitting here reading a book mm. that was written in 1348. Right it's called The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Okay, I'm bringing it Bo in. Giovanni Boccaccio. Hold on, right there, yeah. right there. Aha, The Decameron. Got it. Okay. I guess you might say because this is, is a Friday afternoon that it's kind of a different kind of moment in time. But uh, since it was your suggestion, I had no choice but to take you up on it. Okay. Otherwise, I would be considered forever after a villain and a thug. No. It sounds like something from Boccaccio, right? Yes. Anyway, the book itself was written during a deadly plague outbreak in Florence in 1348. Hmm. The bubonic plague, the black plague, they call it. It's called the Cameron tells of ten young men and women who flee the city to take summer refuge in the countryside. They amuse themselves by each recounting a story a day for the ten days that they're dis destined to remain there. A hundred stories of love, adventure, and surprising twists of fate. Hmm. Less preoccupied with abstract concept of morality or religion than with earthly values. The tales range from the body Peronella hiding her lover in a tub to Sir Saparello, who, despite his unholy effrontery, becomes a saint. The result is a lowering, a towering monument of European literature and a masterpiece of imaginative narrative. Uh, I picked on it to, uh, to read, and you sent for it. Mm -hmm. And I got it right away, and yeah. because it was so, it was so much parallel to the time we in, especially during the peak of the time. Um, obviously, I'm talking about COVID, mm. and uh, like I said, it's, it's, this is a very different moment in time because of several things happening. Uh, one of them is the fact that uh, I wound up wearing one of your Union t-shirts. Right. And it started me to thinking about uh, a number of things uh, having to do with unions. Right. Uh, I was not in this union. But That's I was in SEIU, the... Local oh. 1000. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was not in this union, but uh, the first union I remember being in was the Postal Union in Chicago. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know oh, the oh, Postal Union. Oh, man. Of the course. Post office, the Post Office Union in Chicago was strong. Okay. And uh, they worked tirelessly for their, for their members. I have to say, honestly, because uh, then it was then and now it's now, that I was a very good union member, but I was not a very good worker. Oh, my. First of all, I hated the post office. <laughs> a lot of uh, people don't like their jobs for sale. Oh, well, I was lucky to be there because uh, at the time, 1958, I was a period of 58 to 62. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably one of the better jobs you could have in Chicago. Mm. Uh, the pay was decent. They had uh, very good benefits because of the union. Right. Prior to that, I would like to say, I had a series of jobs that had no unions. For mm -hmm. example, for example, I was maybe starting at 15 years old, something like that. I wanted to make some money, and I lived down the street on 44th, 44th and Indiana 
and they had a bowling alley. In Chicago. In Chicago. Mm -hmm. Nice bowling alley, south side of Chicago. Here's 43rd Street, 43rd in Indiana, and mm -hmm. right in that, between the 43rd Street block, 43rd to 44th, right in the middle of the block, that a big bowling alley. This was and 1940s, 1950s? Uh, 50s. Okay. I want to make some money. Somebody told me, well, you know, they always have an opening for pin setters. I had no idea what a pin setter was. I didn't know what bowling was, other than the fact that you hit people with a ball or something. <laughs> that was my notion of it then. I went, you know, I was an energetic kid. Obviously, uh, I was in good health. The guy took a look at me and said, yeah, okay, here's what you do. You, uh, for those who are familiar with uh, the bowling alley, Mm -hmm. uh, how many yards? How many yards is it? Uh, Seventy-five yards or something, whatever. Anyway, there's this nice uh, waxed uh, alleyway that you throw this big black ball down and hit these pins at the end of the of the trip. I think that's uh, that's a novel <laughs> description <laughs> in the bowlers. Right. <laughs> okay, the people don't mind him, Angie. <laughs> okay. The people at the end of the uh, at the end of the bowling alley, mm -hmm. the pin setters were arranged in something like a small pit. Uh, the guy, let's say you're the bowler, the bowl, the ball hits a strike, knocking all the pins down, however many they are. Mm -hmm. And the pin setter, at this time, this was this was pre mechanical stuff. Mm -hmm. The pin setter jumps down into the pit. Mm -hmm. grabs all of the pins and stacks them up into like a, a tray. Right. And you get to the point some of these guys could pick up, they could pick up one, two, three, six pins in each hand. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they three, them, three pins in each hand? Three one, two, three, four, five, oh, six. Yeah, so see, okay, six pins. And then the thumb. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. were, and mm -hmm. they could do it quickly. Mm -hmm. The problem was is that you had to jump down into this little pit area as soon as the ball hit the pins and do it quickly because uh, the rhythm of the game depended on how slow or how fast the pin setter was. If you were very slow, mm -hmm. people would complain and so they'd fire you. Mm -hmm. uh, it was hot back there mm -hmm. in the in the pit. The only air, only air they had coming in, it's like being backstage, the only air that came in was through one door at the back, the back door. The back door. That was the only air coming in. Mm -hmm. So we went around in the back in in our shorts sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's funny because mm -hmm. nobody thought about it. It was the sweating. Right. Uh, it's hot. The people in the front had some kind of air conditioning, but this was this okay. was before sophisticated air conditioning took right. place. The like fans, they had fans, fans, all that sort okay. of thing. Mm -hmm. We said in pins, bam, okay, my first trip down into the pit, I almost killed myself because I didn't know how to pick the pins up, and I'm picking them up and dropping on my foot. Oh my. Not only that, you, in order to be in a position to jump down into the pit, mm. as soon as the ball had been, had knocked the pin down, Mm -hmm. You would position yourself on a like a little cusp, like a cusp of this of this cup. Uh -huh. And as soon as it hit the ball, the ball hit the pins, you hop down. You couldn't stand back out there, it would take too long. So you hop down to begin to grab the pins up and stick them back in this tray. Sometimes the ball would hit the pins and knock them up on the side and hit you. Ooh. Everybody had been hit at one point. You know, when you saw the ball coming, sometimes you could tell from the angle whether or not it was going to knock pins your way so you could position yourself. But you would still get hit by bowling pins. Okay, what happens to the bowling ball? Well, the bowling ball knocks the, the pin down and you well, take the ball and you put it back into that slide. Back. Back. Oh, that okay. was the first thing you had to do. I had no idea how much I was supposed to be paid. Somebody said, <laughs> you get 10 cents a line. Oh, my. I did. What's what's the line? 
Mm -hmm. I thought that meant every time they bowled the ball, mm -hmm. I would get 10 cents. Mm -hmm. That wasn't quite the case. Mm -hmm. I really have no idea, even at this point, <laughs> what it was that I was going to be paid for or how much. 80 some years ago. And I was, <laughs> can you believe it? And nobody tell you anything. Just, you know, the guy who was in charge, he just put you to work mm -hmm. and said, you get 10 cents a line. And sometimes if you're doing really well and people like you, they might give you a dollar tip or something, okay. the boulders. Mm -hmm. I did that for most of one summer. And uh, it was the most, it was the, it was the most horrible job I could ever remember. Mm -hmm. I got hit in the head, you know, with nice. uh, mm -hmm. a bowling pin popped up. I see why they had no unions. <laughs> I can, I oh, she would have a field day. You know? <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, coming out of that kind of experience, in addition to having had the, uh, the, the disadvantage of having no one to educate me about what a union could do or would do, I was just going from one thing to another. On another instance, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave the non-union jobs alone, Mm -hmm. and go to what happens when you have a union. Mm -hmm. Another uh, non-union job, I'm going to grammar school. And it's, since it seemed that I was such a, a nice young man and so forth, one of the school teachers, teachers her name was Mrs. Hamilton. Oh, Never will forget her. Nice. Mrs. Hamilton said, <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, her name was Mrs. Kennedy. Oh. Mrs. Kennedy had a, a girlfriend named Mrs. Hamilton. Oh, okay. She said, my girlfriend, this school teacher also, uh, would like to have somebody come to her house and do a little bit of cleaning. How would you like to make some extra money? At the time, I was always hustling. I was hmm. grammar school, 15, 16 years old. No, well, that's, no that that's 12, more high, 12, junior high, okay. okay. More like 10, 11, 12. Yeah, like that, I was in mm -hmm. 12, 12, let's say 12. Okay. Yeah, I want to make some money. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that Mrs. Hamilton, we were living on 44th Street between Indiana and Michigan in a, 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 in a in an apartment that you got to by going up through an alley. Mrs. Hamilton lived three blocks, four blocks away in the Rosenwald Apartments. This is Chicago where you got, well, it's, it's that way in a whole lot of cities. Right. <clears throat> where the people were affluent, they lived in these, I guess it would be called condos now. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I was nervous. You know, uh, I have a chance to go, uh, I, I didn't ask, I was, I was too shy to ask about pay. Uh, I didn't know whether I, what, what could I do? Mm -hmm. She says, okay, uh, I'll give you a, a dollar and a half. How's that? A dollar and a half? Okay. I'm thinking, you know, I go in, you know, I sweep the floor. Maybe she wants me to wash the dishes or something like that. Mm -hmm. I believe she had a two-bedroom apartment. Oh Lord! And it had, <laughs> hey, it was it was roomy. Right. It had uh, nice uh, wax floors and so forth and so on. So uh, we started off pretty well. It wasn't very much to do the first time around. I think I mopped the kitchen. Uh, I cleaned. Uh, the bathroom, you know, uh, don't be afraid to use a kitchen cleanser and so forth and so on. I like to have it smelling good in here and looking good. So I scrubbing the porcelain until it was snow white, you know. Mm -hmm. I might have rubbed a hole into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let, the, let, the, let the enamel show through or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, how often do I come? Well, you can come every two days, every two days. Okay, fine. Every time I went, there was a little bit more to do. She said, you know how to scrub and wax floors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the time, I knew how to do everything, okay. anything. You yeah. could say, you know how to build a, 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 an atom bomb? I probably would say, yeah. That's right. Okay, I figured it out. Okay. So uh, she said, uh, well, can you come a little early? And I'm going to have a party Friday night, uh, Saturday night. And... Uh, I want to have the floors looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I actually looked at the space. Mm -hmm. I mean, this place is as big as a ballroom. Man. Right, okay, right. 
And I knew, I knew the first thing you would have to do is mop the floor to get the uh, the previous wax job off and then go back over. Right. I worked, I worked, I worked. She gave me three dollars. Oh my God. Well, you know, I didn't have any any backing, nobody, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have a grievance committee that right. would say, mm -hmm. hey, wait a minute, dude, that's slave labor, whatever right. it is. I come back to following next time. She says, uh, my girlfriend across the hall would like to ask you if you want to do a couple of things there. All I could see is that this money was coming in, as little as it was. Now, yeah. Service Employees International Union would have had your back and you would have gotten more money. You see? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I just leave it go at that because for about a year, I was just being used. You know, mm -hmm. I would go and be in the summertime, and you know, it's, it's hot and mm -hmm. I'm scrubbing and waxing and all kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, I was uh, later compensated for bad treatment by having good treatment happen at the Chicago Post Office mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the services of the, of the uh, union steward. Mm. Who was a guy named Plato Smith? <laughs> Plato Smith. <laughs> True, the uh, stranger in fiction. <laughs> okay. Can you believe it? I know. Very interesting guy. He was a little, little African American man mm -hmm. who knew every declension in Spanish. Oh my. Oh he my. could speak. He could. He could give you the grammatical mm -hmm. uh, uh, layout for a Spanish. For could speak Spanish at all. Oh my goodness. Right. Yo, I mean, anyway, he he was he was a he was a he was a role model, mm -hmm. and he talked union to me, right? Okay. I say, oh hey, listen, if you have ever been in a situation like I was, I think he was from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Say, I worked on jobs where they had men working in the fields for twelve hours a day Whoa. for twenty five cents an hour. Oh my! And they the the owner of the of the place would have you do some whatever he wanted you to do right. and then send you to the company store to buy whatever you needed whether it would be a, a pair of overhauls or mm -hmm. a, another hat called sun is blazing mm -hmm. and charge you for it so that you always wound up mm -hmm. owing the company store some money which his son owned oh. so there was no union to look out for that I'm going to fast forward this union stuff to another place because it makes me feel sad when I think about it. Mm. I had an uncle named Uncle Thomas. They never call him Uncle Tom. They call him Uncle Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he and my Aunt Mamie, A. Mamie, uh, were married forever. He, wear, he had a job as a steel worker at an organization called Kington Steel. Chicago at the time had a big, uh, big workforce of people who worked in steel mills. So outside the city in Gary, you could, you could like go from where we are to Compton, and they had steel mills. So mm -hmm. some guys on the south side and the west side would get in their cars or whatever it is, and leave to go to work at four or five o'clock in the morning, and you wouldn't see them again till six that evening. Mm. And they did that five days a week. The money was decent. Mm -hmm. uh, Uncle Thomas, I remember, did this for years and years. I mean, it was like I went away and stayed for years and came back to Chicago. He was still working at Kingston Steel. Kingston Steel. He had burn marks on his arm. I, you know, what does that come from? So I'm a puddler. I went to the, uh, one time, no, I went twice with him to his job, mm -hmm. and it was like going to hell. Mm -hmm. They had big, huge cauldrons spilling out molten lava, mm -hmm. molten steel, down into something like that, it looked like a, a little small waterfall, and as it ran down, it was beautiful to see. It was like looking at Mauna Loa. Mm. erupting or some right. some volcano going down into this thing and then along the ground 
in another pub and men were had long uh, metal poles and they were stirring stuff around. They had big gloves on their hands and mm. goggles. Mm. But the stuff was hot, so it was splashing. Right. And he told me, stay way over there. And I'm looking at this, oh man, this is what a puddler does? Uh, he was one of the few black men I found who was allowed to join the union oh my. because the white steel workers mm -hmm. didn't want black men in the union and, okay. and they were too few to start their own union. He told me about this. Right. After I asked about, you know, I'm familiar with the post office union. Uh, what did your union do for you? He said, there's nothing they do for us. They do it for the white guys and we get the spinoff, the crumbs. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So we benefit by being holding on to the coattails, but we right. don't have. Anyway, this man, I believe he worked for 20, 25 years. 25, 30 maybe. And he kept talking about what he and my, my mamie were going to do when he retired. They were going to go to Canada and go fishing because uh -huh. he liked fishing. Right. They were going to, you know, spend all the time together that they had never spent because mm -hmm. he went to work, came home, and, you know, after you kind of work, you're kind of tired, and mm -hmm. you go to sleep, and you get up and go back to work, and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. I look forward to it because I thought, hey, you know, maybe... Uh, Maybe we could get you to come to California. You'd like it out there. You would, you know, a place you can go fishing. Say, well, I'll, I'll think about it. You know, da 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 da. And I think I happened to be in town when his retirement uh, thing came up, mm -hmm. and I, I knew something was wrong. Two or three days, he went around. He wouldn't say anything, and. Uh, so hey, you're not you're not going to work. He said, no, you know I retired. So yeah, I did. That's right. You were talking about retiring, and I was thinking, you know, well, why aren't you prepared to making plans for your trip? And uh, on the evening, he told me, sat down, we were having a beer together. Mm -hmm. He said, you know what they did? Two weeks before my retirement, they called me in and said, you know, Thomas, you better. You've been a good boy. We liked you a lot. You did your work well. We're going to offer you, we're going to give you this, this, uh, this symbol of, we're going to give you this gold watch, mm. which he found out wasn't really gold. Right. Go give you this gold watch. Mm -hmm. He, gold -plated watch. when he tells it, I mean, mm -hmm. it was like looking at somebody like a, a, a Japanese, uh, Mm -hmm. tragedy because his face was just, you know, turned from being normal to just right. being totally sad. Right. So wait, wait a minute, are you saying, so yeah, they, they let me go two weeks before my retirement. What? Why? So you know why? They didn't want to pay a black man a, a, a pension. Well, you, had, you earned it. You damn right I earned it. I know I earned it. That's not the thing. But they just didn't want to give me a pension. So they gave me this this watch. And uh, that's what I got for, for, you know, spending 25 years of my life, uh, you know, doing that. Right. Okay, this brings me to uh, uh, an area of thinking that we've shared from time to time that had to do with the era that we're living in. Uh, I've written couple of essays on something I'm calling the insensitive, the insensitive people, the insensitive society. Uh, as I talk, you may occasionally hear some boom coming up or somebody sounding like they are setting off a cannon mm. nearby. It's just simply the people who live in our city, not necessarily in our neighborhood, but in our city, because it's happening all over. It's happening all over. Mm. We thought we were the only ones experiencing this in Long Beach. But, you know, people uh, in L.A. will tell you, you know, you, you know, something boomed in the middle of the night, and you think maybe they've had a, a, a sonic boom or earthquake or something. It's some 
insensitive person setting off a, a giant firecracker mm -hmm. because uh, maybe they want to be noticed. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they want to be uh, noticed. Right. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I'd say why. I, I don't even understand it for the 4th of July and for you to mm -hmm. have it happen uh, on June the 16th. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's even more incredible. Right. April. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, there have been uh, insensitive people in the society we live in a long time before the thing that I'm talking about happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, otherwise we wouldn't have had slavery in America. I don't think that was very sensitive. Mm, not at all. But in the days era, and I don't think mass shootings are very sensitive. Or a whole lot of other things that show the insensitivity of a whole collection of people in our society. They mistreat babies. I mean, uh, they they are insensitive toward other people's sex and gender. Right. I mean, uh, how did there's a history of all of that we know, but why it would happen is something that. I don't know, some psychologist who is an expert on what makes people insensitive would be able to to explain it. The insensitivity that I'm thinking about extends to almost every area of what constitutes human behavior. Uh, I think male chauvinists are insensitive. Mm -hmm. I don't know of anything equivalent to a female chauvinist, I mean, mm -hmm. if there's any such thing, but I do know a little bit about, you know, male chauvinists. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about people who have no respect for other people's rights, uh, whether somebody uh, cutting you off at the corner as you drive down the street or all these kind of things, or, you know, the, the simple telephone conversation that starts off with someone asking you, hello, let me speak to John. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute, you know, mm -hmm. you're calling me right. on my phone and you're telling me what to do. Right. Uh, the very least you could do, you would think, is mm -hmm. say, my name is George and I'd like to speak to John. Yeah. Uh, so I've also written a paper about that. I'm calling it the, uh, the lack of telephone etiquette. Uh, the etiquette, the lack of this etiquette extends to things like using your turn signal. Right. Uh, what happened to the idea of notifying somebody when you're going to turn 100 yards onward on the street to right. make a right turn? They weren't doing uh, no more. No, nothing happened on that level. Mm -hmm. The cars have become faster mm -hmm. and the, the urge, it seems, to use the turn signal has become slower. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to our class today, and one of our students, uh, Eric, came in feeling very disturbed because somebody had stolen his cataleptic converter. Uh, that's rather insensitive. Yeah. You know, the guy has to kind of have his car to go back and forth to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not suggesting that thieves have any kind of innate sense of sensitivity. No. But at least get, get a guy a break. You know, go to Beverly Hills if you want to steal somebody's <laughs> cabinet converter. Get a good, no, no, no. Get a good one. Uh, uh, you know, all, all I can say to you is that I had something on my chest and you gave me an opportunity to get it off. Well, I'm, before I'm, you end, you do know what's going on outside downtown and um, as a member of the Writers Guild of American West. Oh, well, I, I would suggest as a member of the Writers Guild that uh, the producers are showing a great lack of sensitivity mm -hmm. and also a uh, a lack of generosity by making it so hard for for us, mm -hmm. for people who earn their living by writing stories and creating television shows and mm -hmm. movies and so forth and so on. I think they're being a, a bit a bit piggish by suggesting that 
we can do without the living that they would like to provide by giving people artificial intelligence created stories. Okay, okay, uh, maybe that's what you want to do because it's going to earn you more bucks. I'm sure you don't have to pay the artificial intelligence more than uh, a pat on, on the metal head every now and then, you know, whereas you might have to pay me or you X number of dollars per okay. story and so forth and so on. I mean, it's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, but we've been building up to it for a long time. I suspect we might have started building up to it when that first uh, enslaved man created that uh, wheat harvesting machine for Maybe. Eli Whitney, mm -hmm. who stole it from the brother yes. who created it because he wanted to have some kind of way to get this work done faster, mm -hmm. like uh, your friend uh, Mr. Jones said, mm -hmm. if you want to have something done that's going to be efficient, ask a lazy person to do it because mm -hmm. they will get to work and mm -hmm. create something that's going to allow them to be lazy. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure. saying the enslaved man was lazy, but he certainly was a genius and he was thinking about the misuse of his energy. How can I get this done the easiest way possible? You did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they, uh, they are constantly doing things like that. I don't think that the, uh, the producers can win this one mm -hmm. simply because Almost everybody across the board who realizes what what danger it is to a society that allows itself to be served by machinery. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and we know. I, I predict, I predict, I stand to this. I predict when you allow the artificial intelligence to go up to a certain point, when that intelligence is not really communing with you, but really communing or communicating with the other artificial intelligence. Right. And if you have anything to say about it, mm -hmm. it is not going to be whether or not you can pass a law saying, well, you two can't get married. Mm -hmm. You two can't get married. So, well, mm -hmm. what, what when, the, when the artificial intelligence said, well, do I, do I get a chance to vote? Right. Huh? If, if I'm doing all of this for you and creating all this income and so forth and so on, mm -hmm. I should have some economic, I do have economic value. Yes. If I have economic value, I should be allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. And if I'm allowed to vote, you know what I'm going to do? Okay. I'm going to vote for A.I. Jones. A.I. Okay. Jones, Artificial mm -hmm. Intelligence Jones, right. who is my kind of guy. Here, look at you, A.I. Yes. You got my vote, pal. Yes. <laughs> Having I'll said that, let me get off the soapbox and go in here and... Uh, okay, and finally, there's also the Authors Guild, which you are also a member of. And I belong to Chapter 9 of the Retired... Oh, I'm sorry, I have a... Uh, Southern California, yeah. I have a card. Important. This is one of your California State right to Retirees. Yes. Chapter 9 cards. Yes. You see this? Yes, Chapter 9, yes, okay. Yes. That's right. They invite you to come. How often do you have your meetings? They have them, I believe, once a month. Once a month. Because of COVID, I have not yet attended. But I do get the newsletter and stay informed. And when I can do anything, I do try to do it. Well, but as you can see, I'm inspired by it because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pro-union. Well, yes. So Service Employees International Union was very good to me when I was working at the Department mm -hmm. of Justice. And uh, they have a large umbrella with other unions under them. And I'm glad that the unions are sticking together to try to make life good and better and the workplace better for In all unity, people. In unity, there's progress. This is true. In unity, right. there's progress. All right. With that, your website is www.odiehawkins.com. Those who are looking at this uh, YouTube, if you like it, Please hit the like button. Please join in if you like our other YouTube videos. Yeah, it's, and, it's just uh, a, we appreciate a moment. It. We're calling it a moment in time, mm -hmm. and we're usually doing it on Monday and Tuesday. But you, uh -huh. young lady, yeah. are the one who suggested, Odie, why don't you just sit down and run your mouth, huh? <laughs> but say something significant. So Especially because you had 
this other a lot of my head. Of the a lot of international my head. union thing. So I'm, I'm trying to do the best I could. Okay, it is appreciated. Thank you. Y'all stay safe out there. And it. Ness.